Bow your heads with me and let's see God's face. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for this morning, for welcoming us into your presence, allowing us to be in your word, allowing us to seek your face and commune with you like we never have before. God, this morning I am asking for you to show up and for you to show off. Do what you do best. Have your way in our minds, our hearts, and our lives, and help us surrender more to you. We invite your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. A story that's only recorded in this gospel. It's not found anywhere else. But it is crucial to the story of Jesus. John 13 verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them. How long did he love them? To the end. end. Jesus' love lasts to the end. Jesus' love doesn't give up. Jesus' love doesn't throw in the towel. Jesus doesn't stop loving because God is love. The Bible says here we are, Jesus' final moments. Here he is, final week. He knows what's about to happen. His disciples have no idea. Not because he didn't tell them, but because their mind was always somewhere else. We don't know nothing about that, right? Our minds are always focused. We're ready to hear the word. We're ready to hear the sermon. We're ready to read the Bible and pray, and and we're ready, right? We never lose focus. Disciples had no idea what was about to happen, and here they are gathered to celebrate another Passover. What a day. You have to understand, for the Jews, Passover is a big deal. Even secular Jews who have no religion, they don't necessarily believe in God, they might be agnostic, whatever. When Passover shows up, everybody gets together. It's a time to remember. It's a time to focus on the freedom God gave his people. And yet I want you to understand something. In John 13, as the Jews are preparing to celebrate this day, look what's going on in the background. Verse 2, and supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. I want to make something clear. There's only one disciple in all of the Gospels that gets described as being taken over by the devil. Now you might be sitting there going, well, Peter was too. I'm going to tell you, nope. You're thinking when he tells Jesus, no, you're not going to go get crucified. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. There's a difference between a moment in which the devil tried to use somebody and the devil actually entering somebody. Are you following me? Now, some of us have slipped and fall, and sometimes we've said things that, quite frankly, was not jesus
the truth of the matter was Judas had lived in such a way that even after chance after chance being with Jesus, seeing who he was, what he was all about, who he ministered to, who he served, it wasn't enough. Because Judas had other things in mind. Bible says, supper being entered, devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And Jesus, knowing that his father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper. Now I'm going to stop there because I got to help set the stage for you. You know, I know when we think about the Last Supper together, you start thinking of these wonderful artistries of Jesus and his disciples, one laying next to him on his bosom, everyone laying there straight, right? And then all of a sudden, other pictures where everyone looks so holy, so godly, there with Jesus. Perhaps you might say, I would have loved to have been in the upper room that day. Would you? I want to paint the picture of what was really going on in the upper room for you to see. And it's not the artistry and depiction you think of. I want you to go to Luke chapter 22 with me. Dr. Luke, who was a great historian when it comes to relating the story of Christ, he sets <laughs> a unique stage in his gospel. Luke chapter 22 verse 1, the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called what? Passover. Passover. Luke 22 verse 2. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, and they feared the people. Now, pause. We are about to have a celebration celebrating freedom from slavery, freedom from uh, uh, of, of bondage, freedom that God had done for Israel out of Egypt through his servant Moses and Aaron together. And they're about to have this big celebration. And what are they conspiring? To kill somebody. Have we lost our mind? Now some of you go, I haven't lost my mind. I wasn't part of that. You sure? Jesus says that he who harbors hate in his heart has murdered already. People who hold resentment have already crossed that line. You follow me? Here they are, ready to worship God. And they in the background planning a murder. You got to be kidding me. God's people? The people of Israel? The chosen race? Now you know what I told you about the remnant, right? Here they are planning his death. And notice what Luke says again in verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surname Iscariot. There it is repeated. What did Satan do? He entered Judas. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captives, captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Here is the background to the great day of Passover. Now, remember, we've talked about this. Remember, the disciples' minds where they're at. Jesus had just entered Jerusalem just a few days before. And he came riding on a donkey. Everybody's pumped, right? He's here, the great miracle worker, the prophet, the Messiah. He's here. Hosanna, son of David, save us. The king is here. Surely Jesus was going to take the throne. 
Surely his last act was going to be greater than everything he had done at first. So guess what? The Bible tells us in Luke 22, and you can read this, 7 all the way to 23. You read this on your own time. Jesus is with the disciples, and he begins to celebrate Passover, and he reinstitutes the meaning of these emblems, saying, this is my body, and this is my blood. Something to do in remembrance of him, right? And we all go, oh, still sounds so beautiful. Look at verse 24. Luke says, now there was also a what? What? Dispute, strife among them. I just got to stop there for a second. Pause. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Wow. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sin. Wow. And what are they doing? They're having an argument. They're fighting. Like what? Kind of like a Latino family, you know? We get together for a reunion and everybody's having a good time. There's always a fight breaks out, you know? Some dumb fight breaks out and then everybody forgives each other and everybody's back to <laughs> having a good time. That's why Matthew, really, his name was Mateo and Pedro and all them guys. It's just, I'm just letting you know. They're celebrating Passover. Jesus is giving it new meaning. And what are they doing? They're fighting. And what are they arguing about? Oh, watch. Look what it says. As to which of them should be considered the? Oh, man. Who's better than who? Oh, no. Peter goes, listen, I'm close to him, man. That's my boy. Jesus is my boy. I've been there. I've been at every miracle he's done. I have been in the Mount of Transfiguration. None of y'all have seen what I've seen. James and John go, ha-ha, ha-ha, ha Hold on, baby. We were there too. Just because you think he called you a rock. I'm just kidding. He didn't call him the rock. You imagine? All of a sudden, there they are. Who's better than who? They're arguing this thing. They're, they're, they're trying to see who can one-up the other, who's more spiritual? Who's more godly? Who's more close to Jesus? Who's more religious? Who's more capable of leading the group? Who's in charge? Arguments that we don't have in church at all. Never. We don't have those arguments. We don't have that spirit. No. All the while, they're arguing over who's the greatest, and Jesus is listening in. Now, I'm not so sure their argument was super loud. They were probably whispering amongst each other. Maybe one nudged the other. Shut up. I'm sitting closer. Shut up. You're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. Imagine. This is the last supper scene. You still want to be there? This is the last supper scene. One disciple's off preparing to betray him, comes, shows up, having already taken money to betray his friend. And the other's arguing about who's better than who. Lord, help us all, right? How easy it is to take our eyes off the prize. 
because everything else takes precedent over the most important person in the room. Jesus in Luke begins to talk to his disciples about his kingdom of servitude versus the kingdoms of the surrounding nations. But Luke sets a slightly different stage before Jesus starts talking. And I want you to come back to John, rather. It sets a quite slightly different stage. Back to John, chapter 13. We just saw verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was? I want you to think about this. Here they are arguing about who's the greatest and the greatest person in the room is where they needed their focus. He knew who he was. He knew the authority that had been vested in him. He knew the power that he had. You imagine a man who can say to a dead man, get up! Come out! And he did! A man who told a lame person, take up your bed in. And he did. A man who calmed storms when they thought they were dying. And they're arguing over who's the greatest. As this goes on, John, who was there, by the way, Dr. Lutz relating the story, when you hear it from John, you get that intimate moment. John goes, verse 4, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was. I want you to imagine this for a moment. The disciples are arguing. I'm better. No, I deserve this. I should be on top. Shut up, as you already heard me say. No, nudging each other. Be quiet. You know he likes me better than he likes you. You're an idiot. And going through all of this. And Jesus, instead of saying a word, takes a basin. Pours water. Puts a towel over his shoulder while his disciples are acting the fool. But because he loved them and he loved them to the end, his final act before going to the cross was not some great miracle, was not some, oh, whoa. He quietly walked up to one of the disciples. I don't know who. Let's say it was Matthew. Kneels down. Takes off his sandals. And begins to wash his but at this, that wasn't enough. He moves to the next one. Still arguing about who the greatest is. Kneels down. Washes his feet. Goes to the next one. 
kneels down, washes his feet. I don't know at which point the disciples started to go, what is going on? You know, when you're in a good argument and you're not paying attention and stuff be going on in the background and you miss it all. I'm telling you, I don't know where John was, was in that group, but he was paying attention. He takes off another sandal and washes that disciple's feet. And all of a sudden, I imagine that argument, everything went silent. No talking, nothing. All of a sudden, shh, shh, shh. you got to understand, washing someone's feet was the duty of a slave. Was the duty of a servant. A servant washed the feet of the master or of the master's guests in his home. Here is the master of the universe, the creator the one who commands the winds and the waves, the one that can raise the dead, the one who loves them to the end. And what is his final act? It is to get on the soily dirt like I imagine he did in Genesis chapter 2. When he first formed man, From the dust of the ground. My Savior is used to kneeling down. He doesn't have to prove his authority. He is the I am. He is Yahweh. He is the beginning. The end. The alpha. The omega. The universe bows to his command. And yet he bows to create us from the dust of the ground. And his final act before going to the cross is to kneel and wash the dirt and grime from the feet of his arguing disciples. How caught up are you in the things of this world? How caught up is your mind? I know it's election year. Only months away. Everybody's angry. Everybody's frustrated. But is anybody focused on him? Where are the Christians that show a different spirit? Where are the Christians that instead of joining the argument will get on their knees and wash the feet of someone who maybe in your mind at first didn't deserve it? You got to understand something. You and I do not deserve what the master did that day. The Bible says Simon figured it out a bit because in verse 6 he came to Simon Peter, John 13, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? No way. No way, Jose. Only I can use my name in vain, just so you know. No way. Absolutely not. There's no way you're, t- there is no way you're on your knees touching my feet. And Jesus looks at him, and I want you to listen to this, saints, sons and daughters of God, those of you who are thinking about being followers of Jesus. I want you to see what he tells him. Verse 17, Jesus said, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter says, Never! You're not washing my feet. 
And Jesus answered him. Verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now I want you to understand something. If there was any disciple who was ready in his heart to follow Jesus to the end, it was Peter. You got to understand, you might think he just ran away. Don't forget the story. He didn't just ran away. The dude took out a sword and cut off someone's ear. The man was ready to fight. And if it meant die for his master in a fight, he was willing to die in that fight for Jesus. He was. He wasn't expecting Jesus to not fight at all. To present his hand. To be taken away a prisoner of his own free will. That's not what he expected. You imagine the shock and awe when Jesus healed the ear and looks at him and says, He who lives by the sword die. But how are we supposed to take the kingdom? How are we supposed to rule if you don't do something? What he didn't know, he was doing something. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Our politics are not. They're not. And I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I don't care. What I care about is where are your eyes? Where is your focus? Because I'm going to tell you right now, neither of them are greater than the other. There's only one who's great. There's only one who deserves all our devotion, time, and energy. If you don't let me do this, I'll have, you'll have no part of me. And I can imagine Peter welling up with tears in his eyes, looking at Jesus saying, No way, no way, I've come too far to be separate from you now. I don't want that. I've lived this life. I gave up my business. I gave up my family. I came and followed you. You are the Christ. Remember he said? The son of the, through the Holy Spirit, right? No way. So he looks at Jesus and says, <laughs> verse 9, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Uh-uh, no way. We ain't doing this. I've come too far. If you're talking about wash the feet, no, 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 no. Take it all then. Take it all. He almost asked for what we would call a rebaptism. I want another bapt. I want to be reimmersed in you. No way, no way am I going to be outside of your kingdom when I know who you are. And Jesus says something amazing. He says, <laughs> verse 10, he who is bathed need only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. But not all of you. Man, here's it is, y'all. <laughs> you know, I, I've watched Christianity at different times grow. And people in their walk with God. And so often, whenever we want to make a recommitment, we feel God has called us to give our lives to him. We think that that recommitment requires a rebaptism. And I'm here to explain something to you. It does not always require a rebaptism.
baptism. Your heavenly father doesn't write you in the book of life. And then the moment you make a mistake, he blots you out. That's not part of his family. And that is not the gospel. It's not how it works. Your heavenly daddy knew who you were when you immersed in that watery grave. He knew who you were. He knew you'd still get your feet dirty. He still knew there was stuff he's got to work on in your life. He doesn't need your rebaptism. He needs your heart. Now, those of you who have met with me and talked, you know if you've walked away from him completely and you have totally walked away from that connection, that relationship, and you're coming back saying, God, no, 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 the Lord has found me again. I'm his. I want to surrender. All right, a rebaptism might be appropriate for that moment. Or perhaps you've come to realize truth in a way that you didn't know it before. You didn't come to realize that, wow, God has given us so much that has been ignored by the greater followers of Jesus. And now that I know this stuff, I want to follow him all the way. A rebaptism is appropriate. You don't have to be getting baptized and baptized and baptized and baptized and baptized again. That's just a mockery of what Jesus did for you at the cross. Jesus didn't die multiple times for you. He died once. And his death was good enough. I want you to hear something that Mrs. White tells us in Desire of Ages. I love this quote. I want you to hear it. She says, these words, speaking of Jesus' statement, you don't have to be fully bathed again, just the washing of your feet. She says, these words mean more than bodily cleanliness. Christ is still speaking of the higher cleansing as illustrated by the lower, the washing of feet. He who came from the bath was clean. Is what? When you gave your heart sincerely to Jesus and you were baptized, you were what? <laughs> but the sandaled feet soon became dusty. And again needed to be washed. So Peter and his brethren had been washed in the great fountain open for sin and uncleanliness. Christ acknowledged them as his. Look at that. They were his. But watch this. But temptation had led them into evil. And they still needed his cleansing grace. Do you still need his cleansing grace? Oh, grace isn't just there to get you in. Grace is there to get you ready to be there. Cleansing grace. When Jesus girded himself with a towel to wash the dust from their feet, he desired by that very act to wash the alienation, jealousy, and pride from their hearts. This was a far more consequence than the washing of their dusty feet. Here we finish this quote here. Like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
in the blood of Christ. I want you to understand something. If you've given your heart truly to Jesus and you were baptized and you truly have been walking with him, but man, like so many, in moments of temptation, your eyes went south. Your ears went south. Your mouth went south. Your thoughts went south. That does not cancel out the blood of Christ. It doesn't. But notice what is said. Like Peter and his brethren, we have been washed in the blood of Christ. Yet often, through contact with evil, the heart's purity is soiled. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. Peter shrank from bringing his soiled feet in contact with the hands of his Lord and Master. But how often we bring our sinful, polluted hearts in contact with the heart of Christ. Oh. How grievous to him is our evil temper, our vanity. Yet all our infirmity and defilement, we must, notice, not maybe, all that infirmity, all that defilement, we must bring to him. He alone can wash us clean. We, listen to this, we are not prepared for communion with him. Unless cleansed by his efficacy. Are you listening? This moment is a moment of celebration. But it is a moment of celebration for those who have surrendered the vanity. Have surrendered the pride have surrendered the evil tempers, have surrendered the attitudes, have surrendered thoughts of alienation from God or from each other. This is for people that say, not just my feet, but my hands and my head, I'm in. It's why I tell people this moment when we wash our feet together and, and we partake of the symbols of his body and on his blood together, those moments are moments we should not easily dismiss. Because this is your moment to say, I am his child. And my dad bought me at a price. His own blood. Getting caught up in other things that don't really matter for eternal consequences. This is the most important thing. My Savior, who went on those knees and washed the disciples' feet and then told them that a servant is not greater than his master. And if you've seen your master wash your feet, this is the rest of John 13, read it for yourself, then you also wash each other's feet. It's not just supposed to be a ritual, y'all. It's not just a ritual. It's your rebaptism. It's your recommitment. It's your I'm all in Jesus. I've soiled my <laughs> I've soiled my feet. But I still want to be your child. And I want to surrender the things that don't reflect your character. I want to let it go. I want to I want to show something different in my home, in my marriage, in my work, in my school, in my place. I want to be different. That's that song. You remember that song came out? I want to be different. I want to be changed. 
till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright that the world can see that there's something different. There's something different in me. Do you really want to be different? That's what this faith is all about. This faith is about transformation. It's about change. And I don't care. You may say, but you don't understand how rough my life is. Look, following Jesus doesn't make everything in life smooth. But following Jesus gives you strength to walk right through this life and not be so easily shaken, tossed and turned, thrown down. And maybe today you might be saying, I'm feeling weak, I'm feeling broken. Then I'm telling you, it's time to turn, look, and live. Jesus said, like Moses raised the serpent in the desert, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto myself. Jesus is saying, get your eyes off of here and look to me and live. Get it off. Now some of you are going to hear this sermon, walk right out the door and go right back into the things of the world. But I want to make sure you heard it here today. From the mouth of your heavenly father who has chosen to use this guy who also needs to wash his feet. That our call is to stand for something higher. Something better. Your savior loves you. And the Bible says he'll love you to the end. To the end. Greater love has no man than this. There's no greater love. Today, we're transitioning together. Spanish and English, it's the time we do once every few months to celebrate this reality. I want to encourage you, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we practice open communion, and I love that. Because what that means is, you do not have to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to participate. If you've been bought by the blood of the Lamb, if you have given your heart to him, if you have surrendered your life, this table is open for you. If you've never participated in a foot washing in memory of what Jesus said and in command of him, by the way, historically, this day has been called Monday by some uh, Christian circles. And they'll have what they call Monday Thursday or something like that. The word Monday, which is very interesting, actually comes from the Latin and Old French meaning command. Not a suggestion. Not a, would you like to? It's a command. Your master is saying, if you want to be part of me, then let me wash your feet. And how do we let Jesus wash our feet? As we wash each other's feet. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. Find someone maybe you've never washed feet with before. Maybe there's someone you need to reconcile with. And you need to get that straight with you and God. Go and wash their feet. Guys, too often I see people go to wash their feet in the foot washing. We're already talking about business, politics, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
You shouldn't be talking about that in foot washing. The focus should be Jesus. More Jesus. Pray for each other. When you get down to wash someone's feet, pray for that person. You're going to wash their feet that they'd be a man, a woman of God, a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, or just a single person, it doesn't matter, that says, I'm in. Then when they wash your feet, let them pray for you. And as you wash that spiritual dust away, because it's not so much of the physical as we just learned, right? You're going to come into this sanctuary to celebrate the blood of the Lamb. Are you listening? We don't come into this sanctuary again to be like, oh, oh God, I know you don't love me. No, 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 no. You're coming into this sanctuary to say, you love me. And I love you too. Help me love you more. Give it everything. Because he gave it all to you. How many are ready to say, I, I want to be changed. I want that difference. Pentecost 2025. Let's be the change we want to call people to be. Amen. Let's be the change. And let's be a part of his real kingdom. Let's pray. Father in heaven. We're about to transition into something we don't do all the time because we want to value it when we do it. We want to not take it for granted. That moment where we not just read about what you did, but we actually get to participate in it. Lord, I'm asking that it wouldn't just be a ritual. It wouldn't just be a thing we do because we've just done it for years. And for some, it'll be their first time. So I praise you for that, Lord. And I ask you to bless as it is done and, and let your Holy Spirit fall upon them. But even for us who've done it over and over again, let this be a different moment, a different experience. Let us leave it at the altar. Let's drop the pride, the vanity. God, take it. We don't always know how to give it, but we're saying take it. Permission granted. Do your thing. Get us ready. Get us ready so we can call others into your kingdom of servitude. You came to serve and you rule by serving. That blows my mind. That the king of the universe would stoop down to my level and bring me up to his. Dad, never leave us. Never forsake us. And thank you for loving us to the end. In Jesus' name, amen.